So let's get started. In today's lecture, we are going to continue our discussion regarding the Portland cement concrete. But this time, we are going to talk about the properties of hardened concrete. And also, we are going to talk about the testing of hardened concrete. And finally, we are going to talk about alternative to conventional concrete. We have many uh, alternative uh, to conventional concrete. We are going to uh, talk about each and every one of them. And uh, in which case, are, I'm going to use alternative to conventional concrete. But first, uh, as civil engineer, it's important for you to understand the basic properties of hardened Portland concrete. And you should be able to evaluate these properties. The main properties of hardened concrete that are of interest to civil and construction engineers include the early volume change, which means that the, uh, the, the volume of the concrete is going to, to change, mainly because of the uh, evaporation of the water. Also, we have the creep. In the creep, we have an uh, uh, increase in the strain uh, with the time, maybe after 20 years, 30 years, you are going to uh, notice increase in the strain of the structural element. And also, we have the permeability. If you have permeable concrete, the permeable concrete is going to allow the water and the chemical to penetrate the concrete. And that is going to cause a lot of problem. Uh, the most uh, dangerous problem is going to be the corrosion. Because if the water and the harmful chemical uh, penetrate inside the concrete, that is going to rust the steel rebars. And finally, we have the modulus of elasticity. Evaluating the modulus of elasticity of the concrete is not straightforward because the relation between stress and strain uh, is, is a curve, not a linear uh, relationship. That is why uh, it's not easy to evaluate the modulus of elasticity. We are going to talk about the properties and the characteristics of the stress-strain diagram. But first, let's start with the early volume change. First, we have a uh, change in the volume when the cement paste is plastic, and then also we have another uh, volume uh, change when the concrete is hardened. So let's start with this one. When the concrete paste is still plastic, it's going to undergo a slight decrease in volume of about 1%. So when the concrete is still plastic, we are going to have a slight decrease in the volume, about 1%. And this type of the shrinkage is known as a plastic shrinkage. This We call this plastic shrinkage because the cement paste is still plastic. And that because of the loss of the water from the cement paste. Either from the evaporation, it could be for, from evaporation, or from suction by dry concrete below the fresh concrete. So if you are going to cast a concrete and you have a dry layer, then that dry layer is going to absorb water and the plastic shrinkage is going to take place. So uh, the main point about this, the concrete is still plastic. Then when the time uh, of the appearance for the plastic shrinkage, between 30 minutes to six hours. So after 30 minutes to six hours, after you cast the concrete, the uh, plastic shrinkage is going to take place. Uh, plastic shrinkage may cause cracking and uh, it could be prevented or reduced by controlling water loss. So the plastic shrinkage is not a dangerous, but this one is going to allow the chemicals to penetrate inside the concrete, and uh, sometimes it may cause cracking. If you want to prevent it, you need to control the water loss. So the, the plastic shrinkage, the, the form of the cracking, it could be diagonal or it could be random, the primary cause is the excessive early evaporation, the time of appearance between 30 minutes to 6 hours. The other type, this one occur after setting. So this one, uh, we call this drying shrinkage, this one uh, take place after setting. While this one is going to take place while the concrete is still plastic. And if the concrete is not properly cured, Remember, we talked about the curing process and we talked about the benefit of the curing. So if the curing process has not been done properly and uh, the concrete is allowed to dry, 
uh, 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 then uh, shrinkage will take place. So after the concrete become harder, if you do, don't uh, uh, cure the concrete in a proper way, then the concrete will shrink. This shrinkage is referred to as drying shrinkage and also cause cracks. So this one is going to cause the, the plastic shrinkage cause crack and the drying sh shrinkage also is going to cause a crack. The drying shrinkage uh, uh, take place after setting. And because of the bad curing, the primary cause is the bad curing, while the plastic shrinkage, the primary cause is the early evaporation. So shrinkage take place over a long period of time. This one is not going to be short like this one between 30 minutes, to six hours. This one is going to take a lot of time from weeks to months. Although the rate of the shrinkage is high early, the rate of the shrinkage is going to be high early then decreases rapidly with the time. So the drying shrinkage is going to, uh, the process is very long, but the rate of the shrinkage is high at the uh, early days. We have the creep, the creep properties. We, the, the creep is defined as gradual increase in the strain with the time under sustained load. For example, here we have simply supported beam and here we have uh, load like this one, maybe uh, uniformly distributed load. And you learn how to, de 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 to determine the deflection. Since you have uh, a load here, that means I'm going to have deflection. And, uh, and the creep, the problem with the creep, you determine the deflection. But with the time, maybe after 10 years, 20 years, this deflection is going to increase. Not because of the load, but because of the creep. So creep is defined as the gradual increase in the strain because you are going to have increases in the strain with the time the deflection is going to increase. Uh, creep of concrete is a long term process. Like I said, this one is going to take years in order to take place. And uh, it, take, uh, it takes place over many years. Although the amount of creep in concrete is relatively small, the amount of the creep is very small but that it could affect the performance of the concrete or the structure. The effect of the creep varies with the type of the structure. In simply supported reinforced concrete beams, like this one, creep increases the deflection and therefore increases the stress in the steel. So if you have simply supported beam and if the creep uh, took place, then that is going to increase the deflection. And if the deflection is going to be increased, then the stress is going to increase as well. In this picture, you, you see this bridge here. So if you look at the middle here, you are going to notice uh, excessive deflection here. Of course, uh, when they designed the bridge, they didn't design the, this bridge so that they are going to get that large deflection. But because of the creep, the deflection increased. That is the problem of the uh, deflection. Uh, when we are going to design the uh, uh, concrete, reinforced concrete, we are going to uh, put in our uh, uh, mind the effect of the creep. Then we have the permeability. Permeability is an important factor that largely affects the durability of hardened concrete. So many uh, researchers who work in the uh, concrete always say, uh, the permeability is the key for durability. Permeability is the key for durability. So if you have permeable concrete, if you have permeable concrete, that means the concrete is going to allow for the water and chemicals to penetrate. And that in return is going to reduce the resistance of the concrete to forest, uh, to forest and to alkali silk reactivity and other chemical attacks. The water that penetrates into, into reinforced concrete causes corrosion bars. Furthermore, impervious concrete is a prerequisite in watertight structures such as tanks and dams. So if you are going to cast tanks or dams, you the concrete should be impervious, which means that the concrete should not allow for the penetration of the water. So if you are going to uh, construct watertight structure, uh, permeable concrete is not allowed. So from where we are going to have permeable concrete? 
Typically, the air voids in the cement paste, we have air void in the cement paste and in the aggregate. Those air are small and they do not affect the permeability. However, the air voids that do affect permeability of hardened concrete are obtained from two main sources. So the voids, because of the cement paste and the aggregates, are not going to affect the permeability. But we have two sources uh, from which we are going to uh, have permeability. First, incomplete consolidation, which means that bad curing. Again, we say that curing process is very important, not only for the string. So if you have incomplete consolidation of a fresh concrete, that is going to uh, produce voids. And this one is going to increase the permeability. And also we have voids resulting from evaporation of mixing water. That is not used for hydration of, this, of the uh, cement. So if you put a water more than the hydration requirement, then those water is going to evaporate and those is going to leave voids. Those voids is going to increase the permeability of the concrete. Finally, here we have the uh, modulus of elasticity. The modulus of elasticity uh, is going to uh, represent the uh, uh, relation between the, st the strain and the stress. So here in this figure, we have typical stress strain behavior of 28 days old concrete with different water cement ratios as shown. So here we have many uh, 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 curves, uh, depends on the water cement ratio. The water cement ratio here is 0.33, while the water cement ratio here is 0.4 and so on up to 1. So one, we want to see the uh, effect of the water cement ratio on the stress strain diagram. Like you can see here, if you are going to increase the uh, water uh, cement ratio here, the strength is going to decrease and also the stiffness is going to decrease. The stiffness is the slope of the curve. So if you are going to increase the water cement ratio, you see here, the slope here is going to decrease. So increasing the water cement ratio decreases both the strength and the stiffness of the concrete. And also the stress strain behavior is close to linear at low stress level. So here if you are going to have low stress level then the behavior is going to be linear if you have uh, stress uh, low stress level. And then when the stress is going to increase the behavior is going to be non-linear. So at low stress level, the uh, relation is linear. When you increase the stress, then the behavior became non-linear. With a water cement ratio of 0.5 or less, so if your uh, water cement ratio is 0.5 or less, which means this one and this one and this one, and the strain is up to 0.0015, which is this value here. The uh, behavior is almost linear. So this one is the value of the strain. And we have 0 0.5, 0 0.4, and 0 0.33. The behavior here and here and here is almost linear. With the higher water cement ratio, this one and that one, the stress strain behavior became Long linear at a smaller strain. So even at a smaller strain, the behavior here is going to be non-linear. The curves also show that high strength concrete has sharp peaks. So if this one uh, has high high strength uh, uh, concrete, that means the peak here is sharp. That means it's going to have a sudden failure. Uh, while the uh, low strings concrete, like this one and this one and that one, you are going to have some ductility, not like this one. So it's very important to, to understand the characteristics of the stress strain uh, relationship for the concrete. So, like you can see here, for example, if my concrete, the water cement ratio is 0 0.5. I have a curve. I don't have uh, a linear relationship. So in this case, we talked about this in the first lecture. We said that we have four types of modulus of elasticity. 
uh, uh, which one we are going to use, it depends on the behavior of the concrete. So in order to determine the elasticity for the concrete, based on the performance of the uh, concrete, uh, the expert choose the short modulus. So the short modulus uh, referred to as the modulus of elasticity in compression in concrete. And this one is more commonly used for concrete and is determined according to ASTIM C469. So they uh, determine that the uh, short modulus is the most suitable modulus to represent the behavior of the concrete. If you remember the short modulus, I need to have two points on the curve, then I need to connect between them, and then I'm going to determine the slope of that curve. So according to the, to the ASTIM standard, the chord modulus is determined between a point corresponding to a very small strain value, this represents the first point, and a point corresponding to either 40 uh, to 40% of the ultimate stress. So now I have the first point, and this one is the second point. The normal weight concrete, he says that normal weight concrete, because, because later then we are going to have, we are going to know that we have lightweight concrete and heavyweight concrete. But if you are going to have normal weight concrete, the modulus of velocity is going to be between 14 gigapascal to 40 gigapascal. Also, we can uh, determine the Poisson's ratio for the concrete according to ASTIM C469. The Poisson's ratio of the concrete varies between 0 0.11 and 0 0.21. Sometimes, uh, we are going to use empirical equation in order to determine the modulus of elasticity. So this formula here is empirical uh, equation. You know that empirical equation, that means this formula, it has been derived based on experiment, not based on theory. So the unit there is not going to be the same as the unit here. Okay? In this case, we call this empirical equation. Uh, it, it, it has not been derived based on theory. It has been derived based on uh, experiment. So many people uh, have done many experiments in the lab, and then because of this experiment, they uh, found relationship between the modulus of elasticity and the uh, compressive strength. They found that if we are going to increase the compressive strength, the modulus of elasticity is going to increase as well. So EC represents the modulus of elasticity of the concrete, and FC here represents the compressive strength of the concrete. So if you got this one, you can determine that not very accurate, but in a reinforced concrete design, they use this a lot, according to ACI. So for normal weight concrete, the relationship used in the United States for designing concrete structure is defined by ACI building code as EC equal 4,731 times the square root of FC. This relation is useful since it re relates the modulus of elasticity, which is needed for designing concrete structure with the compressive strings, which can be easily measured in the laboratory. Last time we measured the compressive strings, either using the cubic samples or uh, cylindrical sample. And like you can see, it's very easy to determine the compressive strengths. But if you are going to determine the modulus of elasticity uh, using the uh, uh, this curve here, it's going to be difficult. But if you are going to use, of course, this relation is very simple and easy, but it's not accurate. So here we have a small example. Uh, a normal weight concrete has an average compressive strength of 30 megapascal then estimate the modulus of elasticity. So he says that estimate because he knows that the equation is not accurate. So all of you do, all of you want to do is substitute the value of 30 in this formula, and then the modulus of elasticity came out to be uh, 25.9 gigapascal. So now we uh, finish from the first part. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask me so that we can start the next part. Okay, let's continue. Uh, in order to test the concrete, we have two types. We have the destructive testing 
and we have non-destructive testing. In destructive testing, uh, in this case, we need to destroy the sample completely in order to get the result. An example for that, we have the compressive strings test, and we have the splitting tensile strength, and we have the flexural strengths. All of this, we have uh, tested all of this in the lab last time. So in order to get the result, we destroy the uh, samples. The other type is non-destructive testing. In the non-destructive testing, I'm not going to destroy the sample. I'm going to use new techniques without destroying my sample in order to determine the uh, uh, properties of the concrete. We have the rebound hammer. We have the penetration resistance. We have ultrasonic pulse velocity. We have maturity testing. So the first one, uh, we're going to start with the destructive testing. We have the compressive strings test. We discuss this a lot. Uh, we know that the compressive strings test is the most commonly performed or hardened concrete. The most important test in the concrete is the compressive strings test. And as indicated earlier, we talk about this a lot, the compressive strength increases as the water cement ratio decreases. So in this figure here, we discuss this idea a lot. When the uh, value of the water cement ratio increases, then the uh, strength is going to decrease as well, accordingly. And the, for the compressive strength of the normal weight concrete is between 20 megapascal and 240 megapascal, of course, after 28 days. And according to ASTIM, the American standard, uh, American standard of testing and materials, according to this C35, uh, they are going to perform the test on cylindrical sample. It has a diameter of 150 millimeter and the height of 300 millimeter. The specimen is prepared either in the lab or in the field, according to ASTIM C192 or C31, respectively. If you are going to prepare the uh, uh, sample in the lab, uh, you need to prepare uh, three equal layers and should be eroded about 25 times per layer. After that, the surface is going to be finished and the specimens are kept in the mold for the first uh, 24 plus or minus eight hours. It depends on the uh, final setting time. We discussed this and we have done this in the lab. Okay. Finally, I'm going to test the uh, sample here, like you can see here. Okay. And then uh, we are going to divide the applied force at failure over the area in order to get the uh, compressive strengths. Finally, the compressive strengths of the specimen is determined by dividing the maximum load carried by the specimen during the test by the average cross sectional area. Then we have this uh, split uh, tension test. Also, we have done this one in the lab. This test is going to measure the tensile strength of the concrete. In this test, we are going to have uh, a cylinder. It has a uh, diameter of uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.15 meter, and we are going to have a length of 0 0.3 meter, and of course, it's going to be cylinder and it's going to be subjected to compressive load at a constant rate along the vertical diameter until failure. Like you can see here, the load is going to be subjected along the uh, vertical diameter. Failure of the specimen occur along its vertical diameter, so the, the failure is going to take place around, around here and here. The U to tension develop in reverse direction. So we apply the load here, but attention is going to take place here and here, so that is going to split the specimen into two parts. And we are going to use this formula in order to determine the split tensile. Remember, this one is indirect tensile test. We talked about why we, why we cannot determine the uh, 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 tensile strings directly. We talked about, about that. So we need to determine the uh, tensile strings indirectly. The, the first test, we could use the splitting tensile strings. We should use this formula. T represents the tensile strings. P represents the load at the failure. Uh, L is the length of the specimen, while D is the diameter of the specimen. Typical indirect uh, tensile strings varies between 2.5 megapascal to 
3.1 megapascal, of course, after 28 days. And the tensile strength of the concrete is about term of its. Uh, uh, the last test in the uh, destructive test, we had the flexural uh, strings test. The flexural strings test is important for design and construction of road and airport concrete pavement. The specimen is prepared either in the lab or in the field according to ASTEM C192 or C31 respectively. Several specimen size could be used, however, the sample must have a square cross section and a span of three times of uh, three times the specimen length at least uh, he says that the uh, typical dimension it could be a 0 0.15 meter by 0 0.5 meter cross section and the span is 0 0.45 meter span in the lab we use 0 0.1 meter by 0 0.1 meter and 0 0.5 span after molding a specimen kept in in the mold for the first 24 hours plus or minus eight hours depends on the uh, uh, final setting time then remove from the mold and cure at 23 plus or minus 1.7 degrees celsius either in saturated lime water or in a moist cabinet with a relative humidity of 95 percent or higher until testing the specimen then is turned on its side and center in the third point loading apparatus the load is continuously applied and a specified rate until rupture. And then in order to determine the value of the uh, uh, flexural strings, and sometimes we call this modulus of rupture, should equal MC over I. We discuss this in the uh, uh, lab. We manage to move from this equation to that equation. Finally, the flexural strings test is going to be PL over BD squared. So here we have the... Uh, uh, Samples for all of this are referred to flexural strings M in the maximum bending moment. I is a moment of inertia. P is the maximum applied load. L is the span length. B is the average width of the specimen, while D is the average depth of the specimen. Again, we have done this test in the lab, and the failure should be between this load and that load. For normal weight concrete, the flexural strings can be approximately as are equal 0.62 to 0.83 times the square root of FC. Uh, uh, FC represents the uh, average compressive strength. So now we are going to talk about the non-destructive test. Uh, in the non-destructive test, the first one we have the rebound hammer or the Schmidt hammer. This one it looks like that. This device we are going to use this device in order to determine the compressive strength but we are not going to destroy the specimen. So the rebound hammer test, also known as the Schmidt hammer test, is a non-destructive test performed on hardened concrete to determine the hardness of the surface. So this one is going to be applied to that uh, column, for example, here. And this one, this block here, is going to uh, get uh, back to the uh, device uh, in order to determine the hardness of the surface. And then the hardness of the surface can be correlated with the uh, concrete strength. So the device mainly determines the hardness of the surface. But the hardness of the surface, it could be related to the compressive strength of the concrete. So this device is going to be measure the energy absorbed by the concrete. is going to indicate the hardness of the surface, which is correlated to, to, to the strength of the concrete. Then measure rebound. After we measure the rebound, we, are, we say that we are going to uh, uh, subject this device into the concrete. Then this here, this block, block belonger here is going to rebound inside the device. We are going to measure the rebound. Here it depends on how much the device is going to rebound. I'm going to have the reading here in the device. Then in order to know the strings, I need to go to a graph. Relate the rebound with the strings. Normally, we are going to perform this test uh, between 10 to 12 times in one area because, again, this uh, test is not accurate because I'm not going to destroy the, uh, the specimen. So I need to take uh, between 10 to 12 reading in one area in order to estimate the uh, value.
Then I'm going to go to this graph. Like you can see, the device is consists of the uh, plunger. We have impact uh, spring. We have uh, hammer mass. We have this housing. We have locking uh, bottom. We have roller so through which we can read the value. And here we have the hammer guide. We are going to uh, subject the uh, uh, hammer inside the uh, concrete. Then this one is going to rebound side here. Okay, like that. Then we are going to lock the uh, rebound. And then we are going to uh, uh, get the reading of the rebound. Then I'm going to take the value of the rebound. And I'm going to go to the uh, graph here. In this graph, we have a relation between between the rebound number and the compressive string. Of course, uh, the uh, device, it could be uh, subjected like that in this direction. It depends on the structural element. It could be like that. It could be uh, from the side or from the bottom of, or from the top. From, from this feature, it's from the top. But also, it could be from the side or from the bottom. For example, if you have a slab, you could measure this from the bottom or, or from the top. But if you have a column, you should do that from the side. So A, B, C represent uh, A and B and C represent those graphs. So it depends on uh, your situation. You are going to choose either A or B or C. From the device, you are going to get the uh, rebound number. Then let's say that I use uh, uh, C. I use C like that. Then let's say the number of the rebound was 35. So I'm going to uh, 35. Of course, I got this from the device. Then I'm going to uh, draw a straight line, vertical line. Then it's going to intersect with C, this situation. Then I'm going to draw horizontal line. And this one is going to represent the value of the compressive strings. Uh, it's so easy, but it's not accurate. Then we have the uh, penetration resistance known as Windsor prop. So the penetration resistance, just like a gun, this one, just like a gun, I'm going to release uh, a prop. Prop is just like a, a sharp nail. So the penetration resistance test, also known as Windsor uh, prop test, the uh, uh, instrument, this one, the instrument, uh, is a gun-like device. So this one is look like a gun. That should props, props here, it means uh, sharp nails into the concrete surface in order to determine its strength. So this one, just like a gun. In this gun here, I have nails, sharp nails. I'm going to release those nails inside the uh, concrete. Then I'm going to use this device in order to, to measure how much penetration took place inside the concrete. Okay. So the deeper the penetration, the weaker the strength. The deeper the penetration, the weaker the strength. The shallower the, shallower the penetration, the, uh, uh, the stronger the concrete. OK? So I need to device. I need this gun here. And this gun, uh, I need to have uh, those uh, prop, those nails. We call this steel props. And after I finish, I need this device here in order to measure how much penetration took place. So it's like a gun. I'm going to release those nails here. I'm going to uh, release it into three points in one area, here and here and here. So uh, this device is going to measure the penetration of a prop into concrete. And this one, like you can see, is very slightly destructive. So this one is slightly destructive, like you can see here. And the service hardness correlated to the compressive strength again and the penetration inversely uh, proportional to fc like i uh, explained for you and the average we are going to take average of three tests in rec uh, uh, rectangular uh, template triangular uh, template this one is uh, triangular uh, template i'm going to take the test here and here and here and you need to know that this test is better than schmidt hammer because Windsor prop measure more than just the surface, not like the uh, this one. This one all only touch the surface, while the uh, penetration resistance, the Windsor prop, is going to inside the concrete. So obviously this one is better 
than the Schmidt Hummer. So again, I need uh, to know the exposed probe length. The exposed probe length. This one is going to uh, use uh, the gravel mover. It depends on your bigger is more than uh, uh, gravel mohers hardness, maybe three or four. It depends on the type of the gravel. Then I'm going to move from here to your uh, uh, line in order to determine the uh, compressive strength. So again, I need uh, to use the value of the penetration. Get into this graph in order to know the value of the uh, compressive strength. Uh, finally, we have the ultrasonic pulse velocity. It looks like that. It has uh, two ends, the first end and the second uh, end. It looks like the uh, tool that it has been used by the doctors. But uh, here uh, we have uh, two ends, the first end and the second end. So this one is going to measure the velocity of ultrasonic waves. So this device is at one end is going to release uh, ultrasonic wave and the other end is going to, rece to receive that wave. So this one is going to measure the velocity of ultrasonic wave passing through the concrete. Denser concrete, faster velocity. Denser concrete, faster velocity. Cracks or weak spot in the concrete is going to slower the velocity. So if you have uh, a weak point or if you have crack inside the concrete, those crack is going to slower the uh, velocity. So if the velocity move from the first point to the second point uh, fast, that means your concrete is dense. If the, you have uh, uh, the, the, the velocity is slower, that means you have cracks or weak spot. So this device is not going to use to determine the compressive strength. This device is not going to use to determine the compressive strength, but used to detect cracks, discontinuity, and internal deterioration, like the honeycomb. Again, do not correlate to strings. We have too many uh, variables. For example, if you have a concrete element, I have the first end and the other end. The, the first end, the uh, transducer is going to release the velocity, and this one is going to relieve, uh, to, to receive the velocity. Higher velocity indicates good concrete, lower velocity indicates uh, cracks and voids. So here it depends on the velocity. If your velocity is above 4.5, kilometer per second that means I have excellent concrete it's if it's between uh, 3.5 to 4.5 it means that I have good concrete if it's between 3 to 3.5 I have medium quality of the concrete if it's below 3 uh, kilometer per second that means I have a uh, poor concrete we have a uh, presence of loss so I'm going to stop here next time we are going to talk about alternative to conventional concrete if you have any questions, please ask me. So let's go go ahead and uh, get started. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about alternatives to conventional concrete. We have uh, other type of the uh, other than the uh, traditional concrete, which could be used in several situations. Sometimes you have special cases, uh, which is better to use uh, other types uh, of concrete other than the traditional one. For example, we have the self-consolidating concrete. Uh, this one uh, doesn't need any uh, compaction. Uh, like the name uh, suggests, it's self-consolidated. And now it's become more popular nowadays. Uh, uh, many contractors using self-consolidated concrete. Also, we have the short crete. Short crete is uh, good for a situation. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, if you want to cast concrete uh, uh, over the uh, tunnels, if you have a tunnel, for example, the short crete is going to be sort of uh, for you. Also, we have the lightweight concrete. This type of concrete it has uh, uh, the, the value of the uh, density is low, uh, and also you have high strength concrete. The uh, strength of the concrete is going to be high. And we have fiber reinforced concrete. This one, the concrete, uh, we add fiber with the concrete so that uh, the flexural strength is going to be increased. And also, we have the heavy weight concrete. The weight of concrete is going to be heavy. 
so that it could be used for uh, uh, facilities like uh, uh, nuclear uh, facilities. And also we have the high performance concrete. This one, it has uh, more than uh, one uh, good property. For example, it has good workability, it has good high strings, it has uh, good fracture strings. So uh, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about each and every one of them. So let's start with the self-consolidating concrete. So what is the characteristics of the self-consolidated concrete? Uh, first, no mechanical consolidation required, required. So you don't need to have uh, vibration or compaction or all of this. It's not required if you are using self-consolidated concrete. And like you can see here, the concrete, it has excellent workability, just like uh, uh, if you are uh, casting a water, like you can see here. And also, uh, it's going to have fast placement because this one is just like a liquid and it's highly flowable and uh, it helps us to reach to difficult locations. Sometimes you have difficult location and using uh, the self-consolidating concrete is going to help you to reach these difficult locations. And also, if you have complicated uh, details like architectural details, uh, the uh, self-consolidated concrete can fill these details easily. And also, uh, you can consolidate around reinforcement for better uh, bonding. So if you want to get better bonding with these three parts, you can consolidate around the reinforcement. And also, it easily bumps. You can bump this easily uh, because it has a good workability. So, like I said, nowadays, the uh, self-consolidated concrete became popular. Uh, many contractors using self-consolidated concrete. So, how we can achieve uh, self-consolidated concrete? What's the difference between self-consolidated concrete and traditional concrete? First, uh, in order to produce self-consolidated concrete, we need to add high range water reducer, like a super plasticizer. If the first thing needs to be done. Also, you need to increase the fines, either the fine aggregate or the cement. Also, we need to add viscosity admixtures to support the aggregate, because like you can see here, the aggregate is just like a water. So you need to have viscosity admixture to keep the aggregate together with the uh, uh, concrete, with the cement and with the fine aggregate. Uh, of course, the workability is not going to be measured by the slump test. We are going to use it. Uh, we are going to use another modified test because this uh, is slump flow test. So in this one, we are going to fill the uh, concrete in the con uh, conical, this conical here, and then we are going to release the uh, the conical from the cement. And then, like you can see here, the uh, cement is going to be uh, like a liquid. Then we are going to uh, measure the diameter. So the diameter is going to give me an indicator how good the self-consolidated concrete. So this time we're not going to measure the difference between the uh, conical and between the uh, height of the concrete. This time we are going to use the diameter. So it's very important to know about self-consolidated concrete because nowadays uh, engineers using self-consolidated concrete a lot. Then we have the short creep. The short creep is the relative dry mix and it uh, and is co consolidated by impact force. Like you can see here, this man here, they are going to use the uh, house, this house here, and it has a nozzle. Then because of that force, the distance between here and here, that is going to uh, help the concrete to be compacted. And it's relatively uh, dry. And uh, this one, it's good uh, to place the concrete on vertical and overhead surfaces. Like, uh, like you are, if you are working in a tunnel, then uh, using the short creep is a good option for you because it's difficult for you to use the forum in order to uh, cast the concrete. And the nozzle, the nozzle here uh, is going to be held uh, between 1.5 to 5 feet away from the surface. So the distance here should be between 1.5 to 5 feet away from the uh, surface. Uh, steel or uh, polypropylene fibers added for strength, ductility, and the toughness. Uh, also, we have another name for the uh, short creep. Uh, some call it 
sprayed concrete and some call it uh, gunite. So uh, those are synonym for the uh, short creep. So short creep is a good way in order uh, to uh, cast the concrete in vertical and overhead surfaces like this one and that one, especially uh, if you are working in a tunnel uh, where you cannot use the uh, uh, traditional way in order to cast the concrete, the short creep is going to be a good option uh, for you. Also, we have the lightweight concrete. As the name suggests, the concrete is going to have uh, a low unit weight. So the unit weight of the lightweight concrete is going to be uh, lower than the traditional concrete. So according to ACI, American Concrete Institute, regarding the structural lightweight concrete, uh, required uh, 28 days compressive strength of 17 megapascal and an air dry unit uh, weight of less than 180, uh, 1,850 uh, 1, uh, kilogram per cubic meter for structural lightweight. So this one, this lightweight concrete, after curing for uh, 28 days, the strength is going to be around 17 megapascal and the uh, unit weight is going to be less than 1,850 uh, 1, kilogram per cubic uh, meter for structural uh, lightweight. So this is the characteristics for the lightweight concrete. So what is the benefit of the lightweight concrete? If you are going to use the uh, lightweight uh, concrete, uh, even though the uh, initial cost is going to be higher, but the reduce because of the reduced dead, uh, dead weight, can reduce the structural and foundation cost. Uh, the, uh, in order to produce lightweight concrete, that is going to cost to you, but the, uh, the uh, dead load of the structure is going to be reduced, which means that the cost is going to reduce for you, because the weight of the columns, the foundation, the slab is going to be reduced, and the amount of the uh, 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 concrete is going to be reduced as well, and uh, the weight of the uh, elements is going to be reduced as well. So the uh, final uh, cost is going to be good for you. So how to achieve the lightweight uh, uh, concrete? The lightweight concrete could be achieved by using lightweight aggregate. There is a special type of uh, aggregate. Uh, it's light, so it's better to use this one. So those uh, uh, aggregates are highly porous material or they have hollow glass spheres. So those aggregates, they are light aggregate because they highly porous material or they have hollow glass spheres. And it's possible to achieve mixes with a unit weight less than that of the water. So sometimes it's, uh, you could achieve lightweight concrete with the unit weight less than 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, which means that, uh, which means that if you put the concrete in a water, the concrete is going to float, okay? Because the unit weight is less than of that of the water. And we, in the United States of America, we have a, a canoe competition. Uh, they are going to uh, uh, manufacture this canoe. Uh, so they have uh, like a race for, uh, uh, for the best canoe using the lightweight aggregate. Because, like I said, that the lightweight aggregate, it could have a unit weight less than that of the water. So uh, they uh, have a, a famous competition uh, regarding the uh, lightweight concrete. Also, we have the heavyweight concrete. In the heavyweight concrete, we are going to use heavy aggregates. The specific gravity is going to be between 3.4 and 6.5 and it typically has a higher sand content to make up for the poor quality of high uh, uh, specific gravity of the uh, heavy uh, aggregate because uh, the uh, specific gravity here is high we need to increase the amount of the sand and also a uh, segregation a problem due to high uh, specific gravity of the material the uh, heavy aggregate try to separate from the uh, other ingredients because the uh, specific gravity is much higher than the other ingredients. So what's used for? It's used for shielding uh, in nuclear power plants and medical units because in these facilities, 
uh, you don't want the uh, any type of knee. So uh, the heavyweight concrete is a good choice for shielding in nuclear power plants and medical units. Also, we have the high strength concrete. When we say high high strength concrete, it means that the uh, average compressive strength is going to be uh, more than or equal to 41 megapascal. So the uh, uh, high strength concrete is defined by its uh, compressive strength. The compressive strength is going to be uh, less than or more than or equal to 41 megapascal. Nowadays, it's possible to have uh, compressive strings up to 140 megapascal. So nowadays, because uh, we have uh, uh, technical, technological advances uh, in the research of the concrete, so it's possible to have up to 140 megapascal. Uh, uh, you need to remember that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the value for the uh, normal concrete uh, after 28 uh, days curing is going to be between 20 megapascal and 40 megapascal. So if your concrete the more than or equal 41 megapascal, then this one is going to be considered a high, high strength concrete. So how to achieve the high strength concrete? Of course, you are going to use lower water cement ratio so that the strength is going to be higher. And in order to make up for the bad workability, you need to use the super plasticizer. So to achieve the high strength concrete, you are going to use low water cement ratio plus a super plasticizer to, uh, uh, to compensate for the bad workability. Also, we have the uh, fiber reinforced concrete. The uh, fiber and force concrete, we are going to use a, a fiber uh, with the ingredients like the polypropylene fibers and polyester fibers and fiberglass and steel. We are going to use a fiber with the concrete. So what is the purpose of using fiber of the concrete? If we are going to use fiber, then the tensile strength is going to be enhanced. The flexural strength increased by up to 30%. We know that the concrete is weak in tension. So we need, uh, if we are going to use uh, fiber reinforced concrete, then we are going to enhance the tensile strength. They say here the flexural strength uh, is going to be increased by up to 30%. Uh, the fiber, it has very little to increase the uh, compressive strength. So the fiber uh, is not going to increase the uh, compressive strength. It's always going to increase the uh, tensile strength. And also, that is going to help us to reduce the shrinking cracking. We talk about the plastic shrinkage and drying shrinkage because the evaporation of the water, the concrete is going to shrink. And if you are going to use fiber, then uh, that is going to help the uh, preventing the shrinking cracking. All the uh, uh, disadvantage about the fibers is going to reduce the workability of the concrete. So it has advantage as, and uh, disadvantages uh, using the fiber reinforced uh, concrete. Also, we have the uh, perfious concrete that you can see from the picture here. The perfious concrete allows the water in order to penetrate inside the concrete. And this one is a good choice in order to make pavement. Because uh, if you are uh, have heavy rain, and, it, and it's difficult to discharge the water, then the perfious concrete is going to be a good choice for you. So perfious concrete has been uh, specifically designed to allow water to pass through it. So the water is going to pass through the uh, perfious uh, concrete. And this is advantageous in some structure that do not require high strength. So because uh, if you have a lot of voids here that allow the water, to pass through the concrete, you know that the uh, uh, compressive strength is going to be lower. And perfect concrete materials uh, are the same as conventional concrete, with the exception that the amount of fines are limited. So the amount of the fines here it should be limited because we know that the fines is going to fill the voids here. So that is going to create the void space in the mix needed for permeability. Okay, so we are going to reduce the amount of the fine so that we are going to increase the permeability. So the previous concrete may be used as service layer for light traffic pavement designed to capture and store 
rain uh, fall and run off, which is then allowed to percolate into the subgrade soil. So uh, we use purpose concrete. If you have a light traffic pavement, because the strength is low, and uh, this one is going to capture the water and store the uh, whether you have rainfall or runoff, then this one is going to uh, uh, percolate into the uh, subgrade soil. Uh, finally, we have the high performance concrete uh, HPC. According to the American Concrete Institute, they define the uh, high performance concrete as a concrete that meets special performance and uniformity requirement, which cannot always be obtained using conven conventional ingredients, normal mixing pr uh, procedures, and typical curing practices. So what is this type of requirement? So this one here, it cannot be achieved using conventional in ingredients or normal mixing. This one, it has more than one requirement. So one of these requirements, you should have ease of placement and compaction. This one is similar to the uh, properties of the self-consolidated concrete and also should have long-term mechanical uh, properties and also should have early age springs, should have good toughness, should have uh, volume stability and should extend its life in several environments. So in order to achieve the high performance concrete, we are going to use a special uh, aggregate gradation, special admixture, and techniques so that we can improve several properties at once. Here we are going to use, we are going to improve several properties, not only properties. For example, we are going to use, uh, we are going to improve the workability, like the uh, self consolidated concrete. We are going to use, we are going to improve the strengths, like the high uh, strength concrete. We are going to use the, uh, we are going to improve the uh, toughness. For example, if we are going to use like the uh, fiber, uh, reinforced concrete, the toughness is going to be increased. We are going to improve the volume stability and the exposure resistance. So in the high performance concrete, we are going to meet more than one requirement in order uh, to uh, call it high performance concrete. So I finish with the uh, uh, to conventional concrete. Now you know that we have uh, as an alternative to traditional or conventional concrete, it depends on the uh, situation. We have self-consolidated concrete, we have short grid, we have lightweight concrete, we have high strength concrete, we have fiber reinforced concrete, we have heavyweight concrete, and we have uh, high performance uh, concrete. So I'm going to uh, uh, move to another slide and let's 